So I don't need to tell anyone in this room um, that there are many definitions of poetry, but um, I will offer two for the purposes of tonight's discussion. The first is from my high school freshman English teacher, Mr. Isham, who taught me that poetry is an articulate expression of a significant idea or experience in words designated to delight the ear and appeal to the imagination and feeling. And he taught us this so that we would always have a go-to definition of poetry if the occasion ever arose. And here I am using it many, many years later so he would be proud. And the second one, perhaps not surprisingly more poetic, is from Wordsworth who wrote that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its, its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. And what I'd like to emphasize about these two definitions, even though there are obviously um, some differences, is the um, emphasis and centrality of emotion in both of these definitions. Emotion, feelings, experience are central to both of these definitions, and that's the part that I'll be focusing my talk on today. So um, as we heard from Mary Lou's talk, the brain supports language. Um, and the brain also, of course, supports emotion. And these two systems are very different in the brain. Um, most, uh, most simply, the left side of the brain, as Mary Lou described, is more often um, uh, involved in language, and the right hemisphere of the brain is more often involved in emotion. But they're also very highly interconnected as well, where one informs and influences the other. So that not only do our emotions influence our language and the words that we use, but vice versa, such that our language can influence and inform our feelings and our emotions. And it's at this center point of this, um, this diagram that you'll find poetry because I think it beautifully illustrates this where these two worlds meet and how um, poetry is rich in that it's drawing upon all these very disparate systems in the brain. So in order to consider all of these things and how poetry comes into being, we first need to think about what, what an emotion is. And again, this is a topic that all of us probably could define in slightly different ways. Um, but for our purposes, I will describe it this way. Um, emotions have many different parts, and when we're all sitting in a room like this, all of the systems in our body may be doing different things. Your heart may just be going on beating, and your face may be doing this or that. You may have many thoughts crossing your mind, but when you have an emotion, all these systems are harnessed and coordinated so that it helps you to deal with whatever is happening in the environment that is important or needs your attention. And so you may have a certain facial expression that occurs when you feel sad or angry. Your heart may start beating more quickly. Your hands may feel sweaty or hot or cold. Um, and these feelings may then kind of be um, accompanied by these subjective changes in your experience such that you know when you feel sad or you know what it feels like to be angry. And these feeling states really evolved for different purposes. And each emotion, we think, really um, is in existence to help us in a very specific way. So we have, this is not a complete list of the emotions, but it's a starting point. Um, and we have negative emotions like fear and anger, and um, they help us really to um, stave off, you know, uh, save ourselves from danger and poison and harm. Um, we have positive emotions like nurture and love and amusement, and these emotions are really more important for fostering social relationships, helping us to bond and form friendships and meaningful relationships with others, which is a really central, central component to um, human existence. And we also have some um, self-conscious emotions like shame and pride and guilt. And these emotions are more complicated but really help us to um, adhere to social rules and social norms. And when I might break one of these rules or norms, I feel a certain way and I apologize and make amends and smooth things over quickly. So all of these emotions are really essential to our everyday lives, to our physical survival and to our social survival. And um, the brain is very important for each of these emotions and for all the different changes that occur when you're having an emotion. So briefly, um, there are different networks in the brain that support the ability to appraise a stimulus. So first, to have an emotion, there has to be something that causes the emotion. You have to hear something, um, think something, see something, smell something, and this is the appraisal process. The input has to get into the, into the brain. From there, we have this generation of an emotional reaction. Um, systems in the brain promote these changes in your physiological condition, your changes in your breathing and your, and your heart rate and your blood pressure. 
these signals are sent down to the body and change things in, in how you feel kind of um, in your viscera. And then the brain then relays these changes back up to itself so it knows what's going on. So you can become aware of the internal states of your body if you turn your attention that way. If I say focus on your small toe right now, you will all become aware of that when you did not think about it one minute ago. Um, emotions are similar, but they'll make you become aware of things that are important. And then, of course, we also have to have a way to control our emotions. So um, we don't all walk around all the time having emotions out of control. And when we do, that that's not a very helpful way to live. Um, so we have to find ways to manage these um, feelings that can come on very automatically in an unexpected and unbidden way. So we have ways of regulating our emotions and choosing which emotions we have, when we have them, and why, to some extent. So in science, what we try to do is quantify these changes. And you may be um, skeptical that we can do this, and many people are, but I assure you that we try our best. And what we do is we bring people into a laboratory setting, and we measure all sorts of things. So um, we measure all these changes in the phys physiological um, body that I was mentioning earlier. We measure all sorts of pulses in the fingers, in the ear, in the, in the, uh, um, in the pulses in the finger and the ear, and in blood pressure and um, skin temperature, things like that. And then we also look really carefully at the face. So we often videotape all of our participants who come through our research studies, and then we later look at those videos and we code all the different changes in the musculature of the face. And then, of course, we ask um, people how they felt. And you know, this is a harder thing to measure, actually, because people answer with all sorts of ways because emotions are complicated, and we all interpret our emotions in slightly different ways. But there is this really important subjective um, component to emotion which we all can identify with. So um, in thinking about all those systems and trying to relate this to poetry, um, it's a really interesting thing to think. How can words on a page that were written by someone else maybe hundreds of years ago um, influence your emotional state immediately and quickly? So you might think that the most obvious way is that these words on the page cause you to change your thoughts. And you have these changed thoughts because of the story or the content of the poem. And that those concrete cognitions made you have this peripheral change in your body and this subjective experience. Um, and I think that that's definitely the case in many situations. However, it's also possible that it's much simpler than that and much faster. And that when you're reading a poem, that without even knowing it, you change your facial expression. Your lips may curl up, they may curl down, your eyebrows may furrow, or your eyes may crinkle into a smile. And those changes in themselves, those changes in the face, can initiate this cascade of physiological changes that then in turn change the way you're experiencing um, the moment. Um, similarly, you can just automatically have changing in these physiological signals that then in turn um, influence your um, face and your cognitive um, understanding of the of the poem and of your feelings towards it. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these some studies that have been done in this area, and there really aren't too many studies on this topic, but I think these are really provocative findings. So um, in one study, what this was work done by Bob Levinson, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, whose lab I trained in. Um, what they did was they brought um, couples who were typically married, um, but not always, into a laboratory setting. And we hooked them up with all these sensors you can see here in the picture um, to measure all their physiological changes. And we asked them to um, discuss an issue in their relationship that they disagreed about, some part of their marriage that they had different opinions about. And you know the graduate student would have worked really hard to foster some kind of conflict and find that conflict if they <laughs> insisted that they had no areas of disagreement. We worked really hard to find one, and usually we could. Um, and then <laughs> we um, asked the couples to talk about this in a naturalistic way. Of course, this is not their living room; it's a lab, and there's a you know there are uh, cameras, and they have all these wires on them. But generally, you know, it's it's fairly naturalistic, and. Um, <laughs> And then later, these conversations were transcribed and then coded for the language. And in this particular study, what they were looking for was metaphors, and particularly these heat and pressure metaphors, such as she flipped her lid, his blood was boiling, I'm burning up, all these things that you might say in a conversation in order to metaphorically allude to your feelings. And the question was really, do these statements in a regular old conversation really index some kind of biological change in the body. 
And the answer was yes, that the more of these heat and pressure metaphors that the couples were using, actually the higher um, they had this sympathetic or autonomic reactivity during the conversation. They're, they had more blood pumping to their, the periphery, it was faster in the transit time between the pulses, and um, they felt warmer in their hands. So um, the way you're talking about your emotions, even if you feel like you're being slightly abstract, is really um, kind of correlating with how your body is responding. Um, so, so far we've considered how poetry lies at this special um, uh, nexus between language and emotion, and because of its um, central position and dependence on these two very disparate systems, um, it has a certain fragility. And you can imagine that if you had problems or sudden difficulties with either language or with emotion, that you may also have uh, declines in your ability to produce poetry. So um, a disease that we study for today's purposes we can consider as a deterioration of poetry because both of these systems are really, really compromised in um, this disease called FTD or frontotemporal dementia. And in this disease, it's a neurodegenerative disease, so it's progressive, it's, it's gradual, it gets worse over time, it often begins in people who are in their mid midlife, and it affects the parts of the brain that are very important for both language and for emotion. These anterior parts of the brain, the frontal lobe here, the temporal lobe that Mary Lou was discussing a lot, um, and it's well known that in FTD that um, patients have a hard time with all sorts of social and emotional tasks. They um, have declines in empathy, they no longer are able to recognize emotional expressions in the face, um, they have a hard time understanding the perspectives of someone else that it might be different from themselves. Um, they have loss in self-conscious emotions like embarrassment, so they no longer feel like they've made any social mistake, and then they act in sort of unusual and disinhibited kind of ways sometimes. Um, and they have trouble doing moral reasoning tasks where they no longer rely on emotional cues that we typically use, and they use kind of more rote um, utilitarian rules. Um, so in FTD, we often can compare the patients with frontotemporal dementia to patients who have Alzheimer's disease, because in Alzheimer's disease, um, although patients may have um, striking problems with different parts of their thinking, like memory or language, um, navigating um, the environment, they really have preservation of their social and emotional abilities. And so um, in this study, what we did was we really looked at whether these differences in the patient's own disease would influence how their spouses spoke to them. And um, in this study, what we did was, again, patients and their spouses came into our lab. This time, one of the, um, one of the partners had either frontotemporal dementia, FTD, or Alzheimer's disease, AD, AD here. And um, we asked them to have that same conversation. We still measured, measured their physiology, and we looked at their um, language. And you can see here that what happened was that these are in the caregiver's words. The caregivers of these patients really showed differences in how they were speaking to their loved one. So the patients, uh, the caregivers whose spouse had frontotemporal dementia, they used a lot more negative language than the couples who, in which one of them had Alzheimer's disease. And this higher negative language was really associated with um, less satisfaction in their marriage. So again, how the patient's own degenerative process was affecting these social and emotional systems in the brain really influenced their spouse's ability to have a conversation with them about this emotionally charged topic. So um, we've considered poetry today, and you'll hear a lot of more, a lot more beautiful examples of this. Um, but as we know, poetry really depends on all these really nuanced abilities, different sounds, um, adjectives, lyrics, phonology, emotions, and it makes it this kind of um, prized ability for those of you in the room who are able to write. Um, uh, write poems, and in the patients that we study, it's really taught us how fragile these systems are, and when um, one ability like poetry really depends on all these different components, it, you can have decline in any of these regions, in any of these abilities, and really affect the ability to do um, a complicated ability like writing poetry. Thank you very much. <laughs>